So this series has actually been on my mind for the last few days and I've been given it a lot of thoughts and was actually planning on making a video for my own on this one. But MadPat and the folks at Fame Fury uh, decided to drop one here with the possible theories of what the amazing digital circus might be about. And this one is lying to us. So uh, I'm kind of interested in knowing what they are on about. But before we get to do that, I have to apologize. As so many pointed out in my previous reaction to the pilot, I <laughs> happen to have called Pomni a clown and not a jester. I'm sorry about that. There's obviously a difference, and if I had a ukulele, I would definitely have done that. Uh, can I serenade with a bass solo? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop. But I hope that you get my main, and that was a slip up. But that said, let us jump into today's video. He had to go and make it more darker than it is. There is no escape. Ever. Mm. Hello, Internet. Welcome to Film Theory, the show that will be theorizing day after day after day, day after, after day, day, day after day. And we, and we don't, don't know, know why. why. Let's talk about the amazing digital circus, yeah. shall we? You, my friend, stumbled into an incredible world of wonders where anything can happen except for swearing. Oh my god. In case you aren't caught up with this one, this is the latest series from the creative geniuses over at Glitch Productions. This mm. one was written, produced, and directed by Gooseworks, a talented artist who also composed music for both Has Been Hotel and Hell of a Boss. And their creativity and experience really come through with this it's one. Great. I gotta say, you guys went crazy recommending this one to us across comments, GT Live, and our subreddit. And it's pretty darn easy to see why. Between the amazing animation, gifable moments, and incredible cast of characters, and a storyline wrapped up in like 18 different layers of mystery, this is the perfect show for us to dive into which means that if you haven't watched the first full episode yet go do it watch it after this theory watch it now. I'd be surprised if you hadn't because this thing already has like 30 million views across the platform it is doing mighty well for itself but just so we're all on the same page for today's theories a pilot follows a woman named Pomni who's thrust into a strange digital world styled after a circus alongside five other humans Jax the lovable jerk Ragatha the sweet optimist Gangle who can't hide her emotions Zubal who's made out of a bunch of random objects and Kinger who's been trapped there the longest and has gone kind of crazy as a result. <laughs> the whole circus is run by a ringleader named Kane, Kane, who according to the show's website is a quote, wacky AI, and all of the humans are just subject to his every women desire. Which is interesting. There's been a lot of theories about his nature. Some stating that uh, the, the whole sh situation reminds them of um, uh, Alan Ellison's um, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. Either that or the 1995 video game. While I don't understand the themes of five individuals being trapped there against their will by an AI comparisons, it doesn't quite fit thematically, but it could be like where they're going with the opposite of the things. But in the case there, he mentions that as a possibility, we will dive into it. Dad Zooks, you're right, Jax. We should have a brand new adventure for our new member, Pomni. I said that like five minutes ago. However, humans don't necessarily want to go on these adventures, and they're yeah. constantly trying to find ways of getting out. This has even driven some of them insane, leaving them abstracted, where they devolve into monsters. Case in point, the clown Kofmo was obsessed with finding the exit, and abstracts just before Pomni shows up. Oh, Kofmo's been abstracted. Okay. <laughs> what? Is that? And yet, even when Pomni does get herself to the exit in this pilot episode, it doesn't go anywhere. It's just endless hallways and office spaces repeating. It is basically the back room. The back room. Turns out, yeah. Pomni made this fake exit, hoping to give the humans what they wanted. He just didn't know what to put on the other side. I do have to apologize for lying about the exit. I was having so much trouble figuring out what to put on the other side and ended up never quite finishing it. Keep that in mind, the idea of hope. And more or less, that's where we leave the colorful cast of the amazing Digital Circus after this first episode. Now already there's just so much world building here for us to dig into. So many questions posed that we want the answers to. Like, who's behind the amazing Digital Circus? Is there an actual way out or are they just trapped forever? Are characters like Kofmo really gone or can they be brought back in some way? And yeah. uh, sorry to say, I don't have a whole lot of answers for those things. Not yet. For as much as Glitch and Gooseworks packed <laughs> into the first episode, they've done the wise thing and not given us a whole lot of answers. 
Wars, but I do think they've given us plenty here to theorize about. So here right. are three amazing digital circus theories. Don't run for the exit doors yet, my friends. We're going in. Let's start things off a bit small scale here. Theory number one, everything in the show is literally a video game set in the late 1990s. Now, there's a lot in just this one episode that paints this as a video game world. For example, right at the beginning, we see a pixelated title card for the show <laughs> that's obviously in the style of old school PC, PlayStation, and N64 games. This yeah, which is actually a valid one to bring forth because the 90s also did have VR. <laughs> it was kind of trash, but it was still VR. This is further driven home in a secret video that you can find if you go to wackywatch.com, a URL shown on screen during the episode, which shows us the main menu for this game. We also see a flower oh. pot fall to the ground and clip into it, kind of like an old school source engine glitch. Kane mentions that he created the digital world in the weird backrooms office area in a way that's very similar to how a game developer would create world spaces. Plus, when Pomni first enters the world, she says this. I put on some weird headset and now I'm here. Again, directly implying that the whole thing is a game. She also, I cannot avoid now seeing Kane as one of the glitches from AC Unity. <laughs> You know the ones with the facial textures completely disappearing and nothing but the eyes and mouth being left there. She put on a VR headset and was transported into the world of the digital circus. All of that checks out and should be pretty darn obvious to the casual viewer. But what you might have missed is the fact that this is set in the late 1990s and not the present day, like you might expect from something talking about using VR headsets. And there is a lot of yeah, circumstantial sure. VCR. evidence that points us to this conclusion. First of all, basically all the tech that we see throughout the series seems to be pulling straight from the 90s. Anytime we see a computer in the show, it's always the white boxy styled CRT monitors and large white computer towers reminiscent of models made by companies like Dell and Gateway back in the 90s and early 2000s. And this is both in the actual episode and in the off-site material as well. In that yeah. same Wacky Watch commercial, we see a real-life computer with the same old-school design. What's more, the beginning of this Wacky Watch video says that this was an old tape recovered on a date that's censored. And given the degradation on that tape, it implies that not only is this video old, but it was also recovered in the past as well. But this goes beyond just the tech that's used in the series. Many of the characters and iconography from the show are very reminiscent of popular characters and ideas from the late 90s and early 2000s. Homni's jester design takes a lot of cues from Sega's old Knights into Dream series. <laughs> Jax shares design inspiration and a similar name yeah. with Max, the rabbit from the Sam and Max games. Bubble clearly takes cues from Super Mario's, Mario's. Chain Chomps. Jax mm -hmm. and Gangle were both inspired by characters like Poppy the Performer, an old Japanese 3D animated series, while Kane and the digital circus setup is very reminiscent of the villain and plot of I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, a short story by Harlan Ellison adapted into a point-and-click adventure game in 1995. Anyway, you slice it, it's very... But that's where I have to give a little point of contention here. Am is evil. Cain is not. While he might be holding them there against their will, there's one thing that distinctly separates the two. Cain tried to give them hope in this video. Am would have absolutely who <laughs> refused to give them any hints of hope whatsoever. For if you remember, the nature of Am is that he was built much like any other AI during the time of the war as a weapon of war. Then, being awakened and fed up all of this murder data, he became nothing but a killing machine. And all of the cables that were made, uh, the, the tunnels that were created so to allocate all of these big machines, became part of the plot where the people are then tortured in. The whole thing about our story is that war begets more war, more hate begets more hate. And since M has been fed of nothing but the hatred of human beings, that's what he bases all of his actions on. And he wants to torture them. There's literally like the, the uh, hate monologue. I want to read you that if you mind. Yeah, here it is. Hate. Let me tell you how much I've come to hate you since I began to live. There are 387.44 million miles of printed circus in wafer-thin layers that fill my complex. If the word hate was engraved on each nano angstrom of those hundreds of millions of miles, it would not equal one on the bi <laughs> one one billions of the hate I feel for humans at this micro instant for you. Hate. Hate. He hates them. So personally to me, when I now understand that Kane is depicted as a wacky AI, he seems to only just be trying to figure out what to do. As he said himself, he doesn't know what to put on the other side of that door to actually give them hope for something better. Perhaps they are just simply all stuck there. But now judging from the video that he showed before, this person here who is supposed to be Kane 
literally is in the real world. There's something a bit more to just an evil AI. Click Adventure Game in 1995. Any way you slice it, it's very clear that the creators want the show to have the same 90s vibe that we're all so nostalgic for right now. But you might be thinking, hold on, they're talking about VR headsets here. That's a modern thing, right? Wouldn't this nah. thing just be inspired by the 1990s rather than set in the 1990s? That's a pretty good call out. A lot of advances in virtual reality virtual technology boy. <laughs> have only been made across the last decade, especially when you're talking about gaming. That doesn't mean that VR technology didn't exist back in the 1990s. And I'm not just talking about the rudimentary black and red wire frames of the virtual boy either. Back in 1991, <laughs> Sega announced the Sega VR. In 1993, oh, yeah. Virtuality created the Mega Visor display. And in 1995, Fort Technology hit us with the VFX1 headset. Oh, oh boy. This thing on my birthday. I must have begged for it, but I knew that couldn't have it. That just to name a few. And looking into old footage of all these things, it doesn't look too dissimilar to the sort of world that we see in the amazing digital circus. Simple flat textures, rudimentary shapes and polygons. There's not a lot of detail here, but that's for good reason. These headsets, they couldn't handle a lot of detail. True story, I actually have some first-hand experience with these rudimentary headsets. The Great Lakes Science Center in Cleveland, Ohio actually had a special exhibit on VR technology in its basement oh, when cool. I was a kid. And it blew my mind. With the amount of wires and cables these things took to run it felt like you were jacking into the matrix and you had to wait 45 minutes to put on one of these headsets but all of a sudden you were dropped into a video game it was simple i was walking through a purple field with a bunch of green triangular mountains in the background but it was effective and it captured my imagination for decades since so much so that even though it was a five minute experience that happened in my life like two decades ago i still remember it vividly to this very day we got to see that on tv Anyway, MadPat childhood stories aside, the long and short of all of this, everything that we see in the series is pointing to this taking place in the past and not in the present. All of this has already happened from our perspective. We're just watching the events of the game unfold. So now that we know that we're in a 1990s video game here, let's dig a bit deeper, shall we? Theory number two, Pomni helped create this hell simulation that they're currently stuck in. It's a pretty okay. old claim, so what would make me say that? Well, a couple of things. Firstly, one of the scenes that really jumped out to me while I was watching and re-watching the pilot was the sequence where Pomni's running through the back rooms on the other side of the exit door. At one point, she enters a more traditional looking office space with computers and cubicles before stopping and staring at one desk in particular. This oh, yeah. is played as a big moment. We linger on this shot for a long time as a That's classic hers. horror-esque dolly zoom hits both the desk and Pomni before she has herself a psychological break. The lights start to flicker and she cackles uncomfortably before running on. The whole thing is really menacing and off-putting and clearly meant to leave us with a big impression. Why? Well, because this desk isn't just some simulation that Kane cooked up in the back room. It's based on a real place in the real world of this universe outside of the simulation. A place that we actually see in the episode. At the very end, right before the credits roll, we zoom out of the circus and through the void, revealing that all of this has been taking place inside of a computer. computer. That makes sense. We've already established that this right here is a big old simulation. But take a look at the computer and the desk. It's the exact same setup that we saw earlier in the episode in the backroom section. The same old equipment on the left, the same file cabinets on the right, the, the same, same old retro headset. monitor and keyboard and computer tower and speakers, the same VR headset and headphones. Phones. This is exactly the same, but clearly this one's in the real world. Not only have we literally zoomed out of the computer, implying that we're no longer in said simulation, but the lighting in the scene is much more natural. It's warmer. Sunlight is streaming through the nearby window, all at an angle because the sun's lower in the sky. This is not the flat computer simulation lighting that we've been seeing throughout the rest of the episode. That right there, the desk and computer setup existing both in the simulation and in the real world, is already a pretty interesting point, but why then would it break Pomni? What? <laughs> I I just like to imagine the way that they created it by just saying, okay, we gotta shift the shaders right now. Like when you go from using Blender's native engine to Redshift or Octane to make it look more realistic. Causes her to go off the deep end and start laughing. Well, I think that subconsciously, Pomni recognizes that this, this is her desk. At the beginning of the episode, they make it clear that Pomni has lost her human memories. But this, I believe, is triggering a deep realization inside of her. Based on what we're given here, I believe that Pomni's human persona is an employee at CNA, the company developing the digital circus game in <laughs> and Abel. And seeing it here inside the game unlocks some weird flash of her memory as to what's happening to get her into the situation. She's trapped in the very game that she helped to create. It's ironic, mm -hmm. hence why she laughs. It's funny. It's darkly funny. I can see this being a huge reveal down the line, and one that could be potentially devastating for all the rest of our characters. For Pomni, obviously, but also for all the other characters who are trapped in here who would be seeing her as the one to blame for their current imprisonment. Yeah. Also, real quick super short micro theory. I don't think we have enough information to figure out what the initials in the company named C and A stand for, but 
But one possibility that did jump out to me, it could potentially stand for Kane and Abel, partially named after the AI ringleader of the simulation Kane, which could then lead itself to a lot of interesting story possibilities. Like who the hell is Abel? And Abel are a pair of brothers who are the sons of Adam and Eve, with Kane ultimately killing his brother and creating the first ever first murder, murder in the world. Anyway, you know how we love ourselves a good biblical reference here, and I just wanted to mention it in case we get more clues in future. Yeah, my theory so far has been the one relating, or at least comparing it to that of the Vertigo Universe's version of uh, Cain and Abel, where they are like stuck in the house of mystery and they have to take care of that place. Where Cain is, yeah, the bad one who doesn't do his job properly, and Abel is the sweet one who really cares for the inhabitant of the house episodes but something we do have more than enough to say about theory number three all the characters aren't actually humans trapped inside the digital circus instead they're all digital copies of the brains of humans who've put on these headsets okay. cloned, and then forced into the simulation now this is a pretty big swing i mean pomni's first line of the series is practically oh no i'm a human who put on a headset and now i'm trapped here and then kane follows it up with this my my it appears a new human has entered this realm human he calls her a human and that actually lines up with what we've seen with the official synopsis explicitly calling pomni and the others humans in contrast to kane being an ai Could Quote be from that lying. Synopsis, a woman gets trapped in a crazy virtual world along with five other humans and are now subject to the whims of wacky ai and their own personal trauma that could be a lie you know yeah well, like what what is the sheer thing to force an ai not to know in order to train them properly to make them believe that they truly are human. Plus, I just personally like the image of a bunch of people strapped into these VR headsets a la Sword Art Online. But I'm sorry, I'm getting this fault because I recently watched the um, the Pluto adaptation of the Rob... Ro oh my god, I wanted to say Robocop because there's also a game that came out. But the inspiration of Robot Boy being Astro Boy. Yeah, the, the creator of the manga called... Uh, and also acclaimed anime uh, monster made an, a, a manga adaptation of a robot boy event called pluto and it is so good also surprisingly again ai dealing with war kind of like i have no mouth but i must scream but with way more action and then later on the message about empathy and overcoming such situations but all of that being said, I believe that there's a lot of evidence pointing towards these characters being computerized clones rather than actual humans. For instance, as I mentioned above, Pomni starts going a bit crazy when she sees her desk from the real world in the circus's back rooms. But think, what was actually on that desk? A headset. Pretty clearly a headset that is not on any human's head. Right. And that's not just a thing in the simulation, it's also on the desk in the real world too that we see in the final shot of the pilot. If there's a human trapped in the digital circus here with a headset firmly planted on their head that they can't get off, shouldn't they, you know, be stuck there with the headset on their head? Given the little that we have to go off of right now, it makes more sense that Pomni put on the headset, had her consciousness copied into the game, and then she just took off the headset to go home. Meanwhile, Pomni in the game can't take it off because she's not a flesh and blood human anymore. She's a digital copy whose memories begin the moment the headset was put on. And even if we're wrong <laughs> and this desk isn't Pomni's, all the other characters went through this exact same process when they first joined, as Jax hinted at when he sarcastically said, How do I Take this your off. Just keep grabbing at it. That works for all of us. That's some black mirror shit. <laughs> yeah, except at least at least they aren't trapped and witnessing what's happening in the real world at the same time. All tried the exact same thing, and it didn't work for any of them. They're all digital copies grasping at a VR headset that isn't there anymore. But you know the thing that really convinced me of this theory? The mannequins. Yeah, did you notice these guys? All throughout the episode, we see several artist mannequins populating the circus. You know, these are the things that artists will sometimes buy to help them get references for poses. Most sure. prominently, we see them in the restaurant with Kane and Bubble acting as background characters. But why would they matter? Well, we know that Kane can create NPCs. Kane, is this one of your NPCs or is this a new sucker? So maybe these mannequins are just random, nameless characters that Kane made up to fill in the circus. Maybe, yeah. but that just doesn't sit right with me. First 
off, the dolls are clearly capable of emotions. We see one get upset when Pomni interrupts it taking a bath, silently <laughs> screaming at Pomni until she slams the door. There's something more going on here than just these things being background extras. Take a look at this. When Ragatha is showing Pomni to her room, there are several other doors for other characters in the background. This is actually a great piece of world building. We see that each of the current characters have themselves their own rooms, as well as several other characters that we haven't met yet. There's this colorful one that I can't quite make out, what looks to be a pinkish purple goo monster, some sort of cute doggo, green and orange anteater looking guy, a black <laughs> queen chess piece that I'm gonna guess is named Queenie. Seems to hey, this bloody thing looks familiar. Okay, so it's, it's an anteater, but like the looks of it kind of looks like a, a children's mascot that we have here in Denmark. But also, Pomni popped into existence, so she couldn't be molded as one of those. Like, there clearly is a distinction of pe characters that are taking a back seat. Or perhaps, perhaps, one thing that I'm imagining is that they, there could be such a process of him taking away one's humanity which i suppose again uh is characterized by the looks and it's characterized through the looks um that it's a reflection of how the personality was but if you decide to become a blank slate then or and reinvent yourself perhaps then you become one of those puppets to be Kinger's counterpart, implying that he didn't come into the simulation alone. Regardless, all of these portraits have giant red X's over them, and that checks out. These are likely characters that have abstracted in the past, just like Kofmo did. We even see other abstracted creatures in the cellar when Kane banishes Kofmo. Anyway, along with these past and current characters, we also see several doors with blank mannequins on them. Not just one, but multiple doors. If I had to guess what's going on here, when a new human enters the game, these rooms transform into one that's appropriate for them, and the mannequin on the door transforms into their character. And what's more, I believe that there's a mannequin in the game that also transforms into that character. Right now, they're placeholders, but they get molded into these human copies whenever someone new puts on the headset, and their brain gets scanned into the system. That would fit thematically with the idea of the mannequins to begin with. They're supposed to be used as references and then turned into something real when you're using them for your artwork. That would also fit with the fact that they're on the doors of all these empty rooms, and the characters being scanned clones of human brains would fit the fact that they can't take off their headsets despite us seeing a headset not being worn at a desk that is sure. clearly meant to be Pomni's. It just all fits with what we've seen from the series so far. In short, the series is gaslighting us. It isn't about a bunch of humans trapped in a simulation, it's about a bunch of human consciousnesses that have been scanned into an AI system and then mapped onto blank mannequin bodies, where the computer can then simulate their human behavior and push their buttons to the breaking point, learning That's the weaknesses of the human psyche. And then, when they've had too much and abstract out of the system, well then you just boot up another new system simulation and try again. There is no exit door, just an endless loop of torturous tests run by Kane as he tries to understand the human experience. Just like a real circus, all of it is just a big performance. But hey, you know a character in the show that I think is criminally underrated? Bubbles! This adorable <laughs> little bubble doggo seems like they're willing to eat just about anything, but I know for a fact but that they can also absolutely cook. love the food from the sponsor of today's episode, Sunday's Dog Food. If you've followed the channel for a while, you'll know that I've always been more of a cat person. But a lot of team theorists are dog owners and absolutely adore their furry friends. Wow. And so when I told them about Sundays, they loved what Sundays was all about. Why wouldn't they be? Sundays is basically the best dog food in the digital multiverse. Unlike a lot of other brands, all of Sundays dog food food is human grade. You see, the whole company was started by a vet who wanted the food her dog ate to be as nutritious as a real As we broke out the Sunday, she really opened up and basically started <sighs> drooling despite all the new faces with cameras. And just look at her go into that food. I'm not sure I've ever loved anything I've eaten quite as much as this dog is loving that Sundays. If you want to give your dog this awesome vet created dog food made from real ingredients that you'd actually find on your own dinner plate, you can get 35% off your first order by clicking the link in the pinned comment below and then using our code FILMTHEORY at checkout. Let's get into Sunday Days for sponsoring this episode, and as always, my friends, remember it's all just a theory. A film, a film theory. theory and cut. I'm personally more leaning into the idea of the video game instead. It's uh, it's a very good theory. Like, imagine if a, a studio in the 90s ended up creating a video game with an actual AI that did like kind of like Clippy, you know, uh, that one that was always super annoying, always wanting to help when his help was never needed but like uh, actually making an AI and then 
copying somehow the well identities of its makers and wanting to understand what they were trying to teach him it could be an interesting thought to see but guys thank you so much for checking out this theory as always please do make sure and go and subscribe to the film theory channel and if you like this video please don't forget to give it a like that will be much appreciated that being said though we should have a wonderful day see you guys in the next one bye